Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a guest that everyone on the Internet knows. If you've been following the banks, uh, the over-counter derivatives market, his insights have been proven very accurate for a number of years. I've been following his work since 2008, and you know his predictions – the sources he has, it just seems that uh, amazing a couple years later because some of the predictions, it, it just seems like there's the low probability events and then all of a sudden they just happen. So uh, thank you for joining us, Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter at GoldenJackass.com. Oh, it's a pleasure being on, Jason. Now, um, Jim, let, let's talk about the derivatives market. Describe some of the origins of derivatives and the phony foundation for the banks. Well, let me introduce – with a, a very unusual description of these derivatives, they're intended as a compensation for a grossly insolvent banking system. The $1,400 $1, trillion, $1,400 trillion, $1.4 quadrillion. It's hard to, to really count the zeros on all this, really. The $1,400 trillion is a lousy, scummy, fraud-riven, toxic floating platform, which is due to evaporate soon with the U.S. dollar. Okay, some, some background. I believe a, a significant event happened in the 1980s. Uh, the U.S. started to outsource a number of things in the technology field, and in the previous decade, we saw the textiles leave the Carolinas, and no one really thought much that, okay, so India and Pakistan and Bangladesh are going to take the textile trade for clothing. Okay, well, that's, that's kind of low-key. We don't need to worry about that. But when Intel in 1984 decided to outsource its chip fabrication, we call them fabs, their chip fab plants, uh, that was worrisome. And it was followed by a lot of other technology companies going to the Pacific Rim. It didn't take long, and most financial analysts don't attach any significant linkage, but I do, uh, to the Black Monday 1987 crash. Well, why did that happen? Well, it's a delayed reaction to the outsourcing effect. Outsourcing removed legitimate income from the U.S. economic system and rendered it quickly into a problem state, if not an, into an insolvent state. So the derivatives are compensating for gross insolvency to the banking system. Uh, they turned into casinos. They turned into you know, trading pits. They turned into uh, places where derivatives were traded, forex items were traded, currency movements, leverage trades, all kinds of different things that I call whirling dervish. So the U.S. rapidly uh, got involved in their financial sector with this spinning disk of flash trade devices. And I like to say that it, it comes about to produce uh, a distorted image and an illusion. If you look at something that spins so fast, it gives the illusion of having mass. So that's what the, the foundation of the U.S. Uh, system financially is built upon a spinning system of flash trading derivatives that are worthless and give the illusion of mass in order to in order to put the entire US financial system and banking system on it to rest on this illusory disk it, it's it's utterly amazing utterly amazing we we have now become dependent on asset bubbles and we're running out of them. Uh, it, it's like a Ponzi economy that we have. Uh, when we lost this legitimate income, we compounded the problem in 1999 by giving China most favored nation status. And that moved a lot of, of uh, manufacturing and, and other investment into China, not just by the United States, but the Western nations. I mean, just the U.S. and Canada alone and 2000, I think it was two and three. They had $23 billion in foreign direct investment in China. So the outsourcing that started in the 1980s continued with a climax in the early 2000s with, with China and their renaissance. 
to make the United States very dependent on both the derivatives for the foundation and for asset bubbles atop them for spendable cash, consumption, uh, just, you know, covering expenses for daily life and households. So that's some of the origins of derivatives. And it's all to produce a phony foundation for banks that in the United States are, I think, if they're over a certain size, they're, they're insolvent. And notice that in April of 2009, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB, declared a law and, and approved by Congress that, that all these financial firms can tell us, rather than having independent audits, just tell us what their portfolios are worth. They're worth nothing. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that they're overstating them. And one thing about the derivatives is they're, they're just bad collateral, and they're acting like they're good collateral. But the derivatives market, especially that opaque over-the-counter derivatives market, it's so large. It's a zero-sum game. You have a whole bunch of PhDs who have designed these things. Really, they've designed them, so they're the only ones who can really identify them. I, I don't know if all the CEOs of these banks even fully understand half the crap they're trading. They have to have you know rocket scientists on their payroll in order to design these things. They're so complicated. And they're, they're designed almost to, like, fail every single time. So you have, you know, the interest rate swaps, the credit default swaps, uh, all these things that, that regular people who have worked in finance, um, and I, I know a good amount of these regular people, you know, they, they're hardworking people, they're value investors, but they don't – Jim, when I try to ask them about, you know, basic questions about the over-the-counter derivatives market or if they understand that the, that the banks are not using real accounting, they look at me like I'm insane or they don't understand a word I'm saying. And, you know, these are people who – worked very hard. They studied all the books that they, they probably got A's and B's in every single economics or finance class, and they don't understand any of the stuff. It, it, it has this financial system and economy been designed intentionally? So even, you know, professionals like that don't ask questions and, uh, and don't understand what's really going on. Well, yeah, they, they're paid not to know what's going on. They're paid to make money and to trade. They're, they're, tra they're paid to enter the casino and come out with money in their pockets to share with clients. I mean, you, you got to go back, I think, to a, a very telling factor in the 1980s and 1990s. Alan Greenspan used to come to Congress and confuse everybody, and everybody was quite impressed. <laughs> he, I, I called him Mr. Magoo, not only for the look-alike, but he, he, he spouted nonsense. I, I concluded way back in the late 80s, this man is... He was hired to wreck the system. He's, he's hired to confuse us all. They called it obfuscation. They were impressed by his obfuscation. Well, I'd rather be impressed by intelligent discourse. We didn't get that. In fact, when Greenspan left the, the conferences, everybody looked at each other and shook hands and patted each other on the shoulders hey we're great this is great we're all we're all good right and then they look a second time aren't we all good i i, I don't know what he said but if he's confident i'm confident <laughs> i mean it's nonsense it, most financial fund managers i don't think can even tell me what the dollar is yeah, they, they don't understand that it's a fully unbacked debt-based fiat currency. A lot of them don't even know about fractional reserve banking and, you know, how the banks can just loan money into existence and they don't have money, uh, you know, in the bank backing up their loans. It's it's just really sad. You know, they, they know basic Warren Buffett value investing stuff. Uh, they believe a lot of – most of the stuff they believe Keynesian theories. They don't even question any of it. Uh, they think it's gospel. And, um, you know, it's just very frustrating – for someone who uh, has had to deal with them in the industry, you know, I really don't like uh, – I've worked in the industry in different roles as a stockbroker and also as an investment analyst uh, having to deal with people like that because, you know, when you question anything that's different than the mainstream, you just get looked at like you're stupid or crazy or things like that, even though based on, you know, your research and the stuff with the banks and stuff, I could predict – uh, a lot of the stuff happening in advance, and they're like, well, how did you know that? And I was like, well, you know, they can't take money out of the system because the derivatives market is just hemorrhaging. Yeah. Well, 
that's all true, and I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I like to keep it really simple. Um, I did an interview recently that I think was, was quite useful. We focused on three things, uh, the dollar, legal tender, and money. I, I ask a lot of questions, and I get the same sideways blank stares back at me. I say to them, what's the difference between money and legal tender? And they have no idea, and they think I'm stupid. Gresham's Law. <laughs> yeah, good money, good money is driven out by bad money, but it, it, it's so simple. Uh, legal tender is whatever the government says you can use to, to cover transactions and pay off debts. And, you know, there were societies a long time ago that used salt. And, and just three or 400 years ago on the U.S., North American continent, they used beaver pelts. Well, if, if the government, the U.S., decides, hey, everybody, we're going to start passing out salt and it'll be legal tender, everybody's going to be rich. But what is money? I mean, most people don't know what money is. My, I asked my father, and he said, Jim, you know, your questions are almost demeaning and insulting. Everybody knows what money is. I said, Dad, I don't think you do. How do you define money? What are its criteria? And he said, well, obviously, it's the dollars that I'm holding. And it's obviously not. I mean, we, I don't want to get into a long discourse of what money is, but the dollar is declared as legal tender, even though it's not money. I call it denominated debt with one, five, ten, twenty, a hundred markings. All right, so I'm getting off the course a little bit, but we should cover the the types of derivatives. What do you say? Yeah. Uh, now, what, what are the main types of derivatives, and uh, why, why do you think they're so risky? Well, they're risky because they're worthless, and we use them as a foundation, but let's cover some of the types. There, there, there are two or three that I'd like to cover. One is a credit default swap, and it's a basic insurance contract against default of a corporate bond or of a securitized bond like a mortgage bond. Okay, It's bond insurance against default, but the trouble is – they tend to be traded hundreds of times. In order to get a very good grasp of their fallacious nature, imagine that you have a fire insurance policy against your house, but so do all of your neighbors, and they keep trading on it, so they go up in value. Your fire insurance policy is going up in value and putting profits on your neighbor's financial balance sheet. Does that sound stupid or what? It's exactly what credit default swaps are, and I think exactly why AIG was nationalized, because when a big financial firm like Lehman went down, it exposed how everybody and his brother had a CDS swap and was due for a payout. Well, gee, that can't work. All right, a second kind of derivative is the interest rate swap, and I think that's far more important to discuss. Those uh, they're very difficult to explain them completely, and, and I'll be honest with you. I, I might have a 75%, 80% comprehension of them, but basically they're a short-term swap versus a long-term swap. I'm talking about a, a uh, and like, like a fixed bond with coupon versus a floating. you got a swap on the short term, and they're pitted against swaps for the long-term bonds. And Here's where their magic comes in. We're never getting off the 0%. We're stuck there forever. I made a claim that when we got toward zero in the uh, early months of 2009, first of all, that was a correct forecast. We would get there. But once we got there, I said, next, we will never leave it. And, of course, I got emails saying, Jim, you're stupid. We never have longer than a few months. That's the way it's been. I said, I know. And we're on new ground here. It's going to be stuck at zero forever. So here we are five years later, and we're still at zero percent. Okay, what are the benefits of being at zero percent? Well, it means that you can feed the short-term swap with free money and convert it into long-term bond demand. And it, it's, it's a risky form of self-dealing fraud uh, because what it does is it, it – it creates 
a vacuum that the Wall Street and big U.S. banks must fill. The U.S. government and J.P. Morgan and the Fed do this shenanigan mechanism with the interest rate swap. It's what the London Whale event was all about in June, May of 2012. They do their shenanigans. They use the free money. They use the short-term swap versus long-term to create instant, enormous, billion, billions demand for treasury bonds that the Wall Street banks must come up with for purchase. And notice that you've got this phenomenon that they don't like to talk about much. It's called failures to deliver. That's from interest rate swap derivative phony production of demand that they cannot find the actual bonds for on delivery. It exposes the derivative mechanism for producing phony demand. Wow. Okay, where does this take place? In J.P. Morgan's chief investment office and the Department of Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. The ESF fund is dangerous to discuss, and for a simple reason. It controls almost every market in the world. They do it with the phony money and the derivatives. So the entire U.S. Treasury bond complex of 0% short and 3% long is managed by derivatives. We had an event that took place in uh, the second half of 2010, Morgan Stanley. This is all verifiable with the Office of the Comptroller to the Currency, which most financial analysts refuse to even look at because they think, oh, that's, that's kind of, you know, passe stuff. No, it's not passe stuff because Morgan Stanley in the second half of 2010 put on $8.5 trillion worth of interest rate derivatives and they helped to produce the main thrust of a treasury bond rally. They had no basis, nothing. There was no great investment demand for treasury bonds. Remember, that was precisely when we were not getting the recovery with the economy and the flow of savings and legitimate income. Unbelievable. There, there are other minor kinds of uh, derivatives. I like to point out the uh, collateralized debt obligations, the CDOs. They're sometimes called leverage squared instruments. Imagine you've got, uh, oh, let's say your, your typical five to one leverage, 20% down for mortgage bonds. But then, then you, you take an additional seven to one or five to one leverage off that. And, and you make a bond because the purpose is to make money. And the more leverage you put on in good times, the more profit you make from the success and rise of, of the basis instrument. The word derivative comes from uh, an instrument that derives its value off a different asset. So with all these leverage squares <laughs> instrument, leverage squared instruments at work, it was easy to lift up the U.S. housing bubble. It was easy to lift up the mortgage finance bubble, but all you needed was a 15 to 18 percent decline in the housing market, and all those CDOs went worthless. There are other kinds of uh, derivatives involved, and one of my favorite to mention has to do with the European Monetary Union. They did some, some swaps to hide the debt. Just think of Italy and Spain trying to qualify with the Maastricht Treaty the Maastricht criterion, the, the condition. You must satisfy the Maastricht rules in order to join the European Monetary Union and have this wonderful euro currency. Well, what they did was they hid their debt with a forex currency swap to make it look they had, like they had less debt. And instead, they had all these derivatives sitting on their books that were never really looked at in the financial accounting. Oh, my gosh. The whole thing is scummy. We've got a Western world financial system that's insolvent, sitting on derivatives, $1,400 trillion worth of worthless crap, ready to produce a financial nuclear bomb site, bomb site damage. The entire U.S. economy is dependent on the 0% interest and the bond monetization from QE. So the entire financial system is a Ponzi scheme underpinned by the derivatives, especially the interest rate swap, while the actual Main Street economy is dependent upon asset bubbles. So it, too, is a Ponzi economy, Ponzi scheme. 
We're running out of asset bubbles. Now, what does the U.S. public rely on for an asset bubble to derive income and wealth extraction for, for spending, consumption, you know, meeting the bills, going to school, doing the repairs, paying the utilities? Not much, and that's why the U.S. is in this terminal phase of a downward spiral recession. Yeah, and um, another thing I notice is, you know, despite all these QE programs, it just seems, you know, with the – and this is using Keynesian framework because from Austrian school free market perspective, the velocity of money and GDP calculations are really not, meaning, not meaningful. But the, using the Keynesian framework of if the economy is healthy or not, the velocity of money is not going into the economy. It's falling off a cliff. And all of that printed money, uh, it, a lot of it is stored at the banks, uh, I mean at the Fed as reserves. The banks don't seem to be spending a lot of it or it's going, you know, it's being used as collateral and uh, going into the asset markets, like you said, to create either bubbles uh, here in the United States in the real estate market, bond market, regular stock market, or in uh, foreign asset prices. Yeah, there's a, a big trade going on. It's not a derivative. It's, a, it's simpler than a derivative, and it's, it's understandable uh, to, to many financial analysts. You, first of all, you mentioned the money velocity going down while the money supply is going up. This is the contradiction of recovery. This is the refuting evidence that QE and monetary policy is actually working. You're seeing the money velocity go down something like 50% in the last five years, while the money supply has gone up three, four, five fold. The new trade that the Wall Street banks are doing and using heavily to produce income, it's not from you know, investment banking and IPOs for stocks and bond issuance. It's not from investment banking. It's from casino. The trade works like this. They take some of the free money that they're, uh, at, they have at their available spigot because they're friends of the Fed. They use the free money and they put on leveraged bond futures trades, but they do it with a carry trade framework. They short the, the short term and they go long the long term. They borrow short term money and invest long term. That's why you have this uh, phenomenon where we're at 3% or less all the time for the long-term bond. Well, why is that? There are no buyers. Well, not only do you have the Fed uh, buying up, I think, close to 80, maybe $100 billion a month worth of Treasury bonds, not only do you have that, but they've got cover of the Wall Street banks doing the bond carry trade, shorting the, the, the bill and going long the bond, shorting the, uh, the short-term Borrowing short-term money, investing long-term, using leverage. So if we ever see a, a move that's sudden, upward, in, in the bond yields, you're going to have a massive event of, of leveraged unwind from the Wall Street banks. And it, it would cause, for instance, in one month, in one and a half months, a move from, say, 2.7 to 4.1 on the long-term 10-year bond. This is, this is unbelievably dangerous setting that we're in. And these forecasts of saying the 0% forever are incredibly easy and very much against the grain for everything uh, that these financial analysts tend to believe in and, and learn improperly for their, their educational process. And, and the bond monetization will never end. It can't end. Because if it does, it'll break the derivatives. You can't, you can't allow the interest rates to go up because the assassin to the derivatives will be the Wall Street portfolios that have the bond carry trade in place. If it reverses, it'll kill the whole $1,400 trillion derivative complex. Oh, this is uh, – it, it's beyond pathetic. And, you know, we're not alone. This just lastly, in, over in Europe, uh, Mario Draghi, I like to call him Prince Mario, Prince Draghi, um, he tried something several months ago called the Long-Term Refinance Operation, the LTRO. That was a patch that was to act much like bond monetization. Okay, we had some fresh new bond demand, liquidity to the system. All right, served the same function, had a different name. Well, the German High Court declared it as, as illegal. 
and, and it, its features were kind of simple but powerful. They were super senior notes, which meant that they were higher in subordination, in seniority, than the sovereign bonds of Italy and Spain and Greece. They just declared that these new bonds were of higher seniority. Well, the German high court slammed it. You know, this is what the system's built on. These patches are pathetic. The foundations are whirling dervishes that give the illusion, illusion of mass. We're in big trouble here, and, and we're going to war, Jason, to protect the dollar and to defend it rather than to see the implosion that's inevitable. We're looking for Russia as a scapegoat to blame for the collapse of the U.S. financial structure, sending the U.S. into the third world from its chronic depression. When you've got 23% unemployment like John Williams of shadow government declares and estimates, 23% jobless, that's by counting the people who don't work. A, a novel concept, not the people who are collecting uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance at their state level. But if you count the people who don't work, who are able-bodied and, and perhaps want to work, it's 23%. That's depression era. It's it's even it's even higher, Jim. Unfortunately, for the last couple of graduating classes of college seniors, I think the statistics are coming out that the 2013 and 2014 uh, college graduating senior classes, more than 80 percent of them cannot find full time jobs. So they're lucky if they can get one part time job or two part time jobs. And, um, you know, they have a humongous amount of student loan debt. And it's, uh, you know, you're just going to start off in life. You have a lot of debt. It's very, very sad. Well, it's just one more new class of debt slave. Uh, I, I like to point to the 2005 Bankruptcy Reform Act that very few people studied closely. They looked at it and said, okay, so individuals and in declare bankruptcy, they can't use Chapter 7 and wipe out their debts and walk away. They have to go to Chapter 13 and restructure everything and hold on to their tax obligations. All right, well, fine. But there was a second side to that having to do with, with debt slavery. Uh, take a closer look at the law. And you'll see that your savings account in the bank, your bank CDs, your passbook savings, they're not your property. You gave that money to the bank. It is unsecured credit. And they will even give interest on your withdrawals if they feel like giving it to you. And right now they're giving less of your money back on demand, holding back on, on check redemptions and a lot of different things, evidence of, of a failed system. All right, so if your savings is unsecured credit, what's secured? It's derivatives. The banks hold a, a, a cartload, a truckload, a boatload of derivatives, and they're called technically, I'm not making this up, they're called secured credit. What are they secured by? Your savings. So if the bank or financial firm evaporates, gets liquidated, goes into failure, you lost your savings. It's not yours. You gave it to the bank as unsecured credit. They changed the law, pulled the rug out from your ownership of your own money. That's why I say to people, get your money out of the bank. Get your money out of stocks. Get your money out of bonds. Get your money into gold and silver. Now, um, back to the the outline that we agreed upon, Um. Talk about the the role of derivatives in the uh, Lehman Investment Bank failure, because you know it seems to me that uh, Lehman was maybe a sacrificial lamb to the system, because you know that that's free market forces, right? They actually allowed. It, we, if we have capitalism in free markets, we're supposed to allow firms to fail. But then um, after Lehman failed, you know, you had all these politicians and bureaucrats and a lot of progressive people come out and say, you know, we can't allow any more firms to fail and things like that. Uh, what, what's your uh, opinion of Lehman and derivatives? It was a kill job. I'd like to give a preface. We're, we're all familiar – well, 99% of us are familiar that in 2007 we had a subprime bond problem. And then we blamed it all on the lousy underwriting of the mortgages. Okay, well, that's, that's kind of understood. But why in 2007 did it come, come apart? Well, a simple reason. China started dumping Fannie Mae bonds. Why did China do that? Because they were angry that Wall Street – leased a bunch of Mao Zedong era gold on the back end of the 1999 most favored nation status. 
And this lease of Chinese government gold had a five or six year time length on the contract. And Wall Street reneged on it. So China became suddenly a trade war adversary and started dumping Fannie Mae bonds. That, that just pulled the, the entire system apart in the mortgage bond, you know, the mortgage-backed securities arena and all the different weird instruments associated with it. It caused the sub, subprime fuse to be lit. Now, which bank was the most vulnerable in Wall Street to all the mortgage bond problems? It was not Lehman Brothers. It was Goldman Sachs. So Goldman Sachs agreed with J.P. Morgan to deny the redemption cash payouts on, on maturing instruments, on settled instruments, and whatever trades were involved with Lehman Brothers. So what they did was they, they cut off their air supply, cut off their water supply, cut off their food supply, and quickly Lehman died. But after they issued a lot of complaints that went on deaf ears. Immediately afterwards, AIG was nationalized in order to have Goldman Sachs, which controls the Department of Treasury to many, many degrees. Goldman Sachs then ordered AIG to give Goldman Sachs 100 cents on the payout, payout for credit default swaps held on Lehman Brothers and other instruments. So they got a rosy payout that no one else got. Why didn't other firms get 100 cents on the dollar? Because they weren't Goldman Sachs. Why did Goldman Sachs get it? Well, the official story was, well, they were first in line. Why were they first in line? Because they controlled the Treasury. That's why they wow. nationalized AIG. All right, so <clears throat> they not only nationalized AIG to help out Goldman Sachs. That was the immediate mission. The longer-term mission was to control the derivative implosion because suddenly – it is very clear to the true experts that the U.S. financial system went insolvent. And it, it wasn't, what was it? Okay, Lehman was September 08, and the FASB accounting rule, uh, the bill before the Congress, that was April 1st, 09. So in five months or less, we had an emergency declaration that these big banks could declare whatever they wanted for their portfolio asset values. Okay, well, wh why'd they do that? Because they're insolvent. Well, what if they just liquidated some of them? The whole derivative mountain would, would collapse. That's why. So AIG was nationalized, and then later quantitative easing came in to cover the derivative explosion and implosion. They needed to hide it all. Okay, the, the, the Lehman event had a derivative implosion events associated with it, but very well disguised. It motivated the, the continuation of the zero interest rate policy forever. I call it ZERP forever. And it motivated the QE to infinity. When we had in uh, the summer months of, of 13, 2013, we had this taper talk. I'm on record as week after week putting out articles or interviews or whatever saying, no, no, they're, they're going to take that back. They can't taper. The QE. They can't. And it's just going to be a few more months. Well, there it came, September. They, they stopped talking about taper. They said, no, we can't. We can't discontinue what we're doing. Why? Because they have a derivative implosion. Why? Because no one wants the U.S. government debt. No one's a buyer of the Treasury bonds. The derivatives help to cover the lack of demand for Treasury bonds. So we got the derivative foundation evaporating and the U.S. is stuck in hyper-monetary inflation to finance the debt. I believe the QE volume is five to ten times greater than stated. When you count the derivatives they're covering, that, that you know, no one really talks much about, and they don't offer data, like in the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, oh, this amount per month was covered for the derivatives by, uh, you know, fake money off the press, with the Weimar nameplate, why is it that in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the United States was harshly critical of banana republics for printing money to cover their debt? Yet when we do it, it's good. Well, there, there, there's a lot of hypocrisy from uh, all different levels of the U.S. government. I mean, 
the Ukraine is not an outline, but we could just talk about it briefly. I mean, the, the Ukraine has a democratic election, right? And then the U.S. decides, oh, well, we don't like that type of democracy. So, you know, George Soros and the Council of Foreign Relations and the other people involved, you know, they're just hypocrites. So they, they think they're above the law. They don't like the rules that are in place. Um, the banks, uh, like you mentioned there, they're, uh, any other corporation, if they don't use generally accepted accounting principles, uh, they mark their assets to model. They drastically overvalue their assets or they undervalue you know, sandbagging for accounting tricks. Their CFO and their executives risk going to prison for a very, very long time. But, um, you know, Enron type of accounting. And um, the banks are seem to be getting an exemption to it. Uh, you know, they're protected by the government. I guess the Department of Justice won't even prosecute any bankers uh, anymore at this point for fear of crashing the whole system again. Well, yeah, and you mentioned Enron. I'd like to just, as a footnote, describe what Enron was. It was a Harvard Business School professor project, kind of a, a research paper. Hey, wouldn't it be interesting if we created a phony electricity market and, and started trading and then maybe even have a company based on that? All right, so they put to work J.P. Morgan, that made, who made shell companies, special purpose entities, Oh, that sounds like a shell corp. Uh huh. All right, then they use Citigroup money, Citibank money. So with the Harvard plan, J.P. Morgan corporate setup, and Citigroup money, they created a sham called Enron. And uh, Harvard made a lot of money on the way up, and then they started shorting it on the way down. So they made money up and down, but justice came to Harvard and their endowment fund from a strange backlash. <laughs> they lost several billion dollars on derivatives. I mean, these derivatives are all over the place. They're cancer on the balance sheets. They're cancer for a foundation. They, it, it's amazing what's going on, Jason, and, and also doubly amazing that so few people have any idea what's happening. Well, they intentionally don't teach any of this in school. So, I mean, it's it's just like they don't teach you, you know, what, what debt-based fiat currency is. They don't teach you what money really is. You're just supposed to expect that it's a dollar. I mean, it's like uh, the, the amount of people are very book smart. They've read the textbooks and things like that. But the problem is the material that they're being taught. You know, they're being taught Keynesian economics. They're being taught um, – they're not being taught – that uh, you know, sh you should want to own your own business and generate your cash flow that way. You're being taught that you should be a good little obedient employee and that uh, you should spend all your money. And that's how the economy works so good. I mean, it's just it's so ridiculous. Now, now that I've woken up, some of the stuff that's been taught in schools and um, by the mainstream media for a very long time. Well, I took a few courses in economics in college, and I have a funny little phrase that I put in my bio. I have a PhD in statistics. It, it was earned. It's not like Greenspan's honorary economics PhD. Uh, Bernanke owned, earned a PhD, but with a false revisionist history uh, of the Great Depression. So I'd like to take away Bernanke's PhD. But I like to say in my bio that I'm unencumbered by the limitations of economics credentials. I can understand economics because I'm not taught by the system. When I, I took a few courses, I took uh, you know microeconomics and macroeconomics and took intermediate level, and then then I took a course that that really was the end of the road for me. I took money and banking, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I actually had a conversation after the second class with the professor, and I said, look, I, I'd, I'd like you to please help me to understand something here. You've got a big graph with 30 different elements and arrows pointing in every which direction. I said, you know, I'm not really understanding all this, but to me it looks like a big money laundering graph. And he laughed and he said, no, no, you'll understand by the end of the course. And I said, no, I don't think so. I'm dropping this course. This is junk. So I got out. What they don't teach in school, graduate school level economics and finance, are three things. That regulatory bodies can be bought so they don't regulate. That bankruptcy can be avoided just by declaration that they're too big to fail, covering their fraudulent elements. And that narco money is a big foundation for the banks that could be responsible for a quarter or a third of all their foundation income, in addition, say, to their treasury bond carry trade. So take away the 
treasury bond carry trade, take away their uh, narco funds, and take away their whirling dervish of flash trading on derivative BS instruments, these are hollow chambers. And it's no wonder they're not lending. They're broken. So, you know, you don't, they don't teach these things in graduate school. One of my big advantages is that when I was in college, I don't mind admitting this because it, uh, it was 40 years ago. You know, I may sound young, but I'm not real young. I'm, I'm over 60. I just keep really good health. No smoke, no drink, good diet, a lot of vitamins, and, you know, good exercise. I'm heading to the gym maybe later today or tomorrow. Um, th these things, oh, gosh, they're so broken. I'm sorry. I, I, I get off on tangents. But let's go to the London Whale. He, he's more fun. Yeah, yeah. The, the the London Whale, I mean, the the stuff that came out, I'm sure it wasn't the real story. I mean, the, even the real, even the official story that came out from Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan and some of the other uh, J.P. Morgan officials, it just seems ridiculous that, um you know, the losses are contained, blah, 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 blah. You know, it just seemed ba basically like a normal politician coming out and saying um, something, and then, you know, three days later, the director of misinformation uh, was completely proven wrong. The London Whale was a giant uh, festering boil that leaked rela relating to the interest rate swaps. Now, they came out with a story. This happened and broke in May of 2012. I remember like it was yesterday. Because I remember exactly where I was sitting, an apartment that I was living in, window that I was looking out of, phone calls I was making. I made a comment to a couple of friends. Oh, gosh, guarantee it's ten times bigger than what J.P. Morgan admits. And, and then I got a, a message from my, my excellent source. I call him The Voice. He's a gold trader who uh, has a Rolodex that would, is really quite amazing, involves a lot of central banks, including eastern central banks. Uh, he came right out and said, they're talking about how it's under a billion, Jim, but I can guarantee you it's it's 10 or more. And it'll come out in the next few weeks. Well, a week or two later, it came out that uh, J.P. Morgan admitted that it was 1.7. And now their official line of bull is that it's 8.9 or 8.7 billion. But it, it's not that simple. It's not that simple at all because they came out with a statement that was – never really investigated by the stupid financial analyst community. I'm sorry to give out insults, but follow my train of thought. J.P. Morgan said they lost a lot of money in the previous quarter from derivatives having to do with the Forex tied to the sovereign bonds of Southern Europe. Okay, so Rob Kirby and I got on the case and started looking at the previous quarter. Every single pig's sovereign bond improved in value. Okay, so what was the basis of their loss? So we, we put our heads together again, and Rob said, you know, I, I bet you it's volatility on the treasury bonds. I said, okay, well, let's take a look at that, that six-month period, that three-month period. And there it was. The U.S. 10-year Treasury bond went from something like, I'm, I'm going on memory, went from something like 1.7 to 2.4%. And the old saying with derivatives is, movement is bad. It doesn't matter whether it's up or down because it's all leveraged and the movement exaggerates the losses, whether it's up or down. And, and I like to make an analogy. Uh, the interest rate swaps are, are kind of like a 200-foot, a 200-tower, I'm sorry, 200-story tower building. they got 200 stories to it. Well, if you get wind from the east or the west or the north or the south, doesn't matter. If it starts getting windy, the building moves. doesn't matter which way it moves. The fact that it moves might cause cracks at a much lower floor. So that's what happened, and the J.P. Morgan losses – uh, were with interest rate swaps. And as information came out slowly and more and more and more regarding Bruno Ixel, the London whale, it became quite obvious it's from their interest rate swap derivatives. It wasn't from their Forex trading. No, they've, they've got 20 times the amount of interest rate swap derivative trading. So 
That is the office, the chief investment office, the CIO of J.P. Morgan. That is where they produce demand for the long-term treasury bonds from the free 0% money that enables them to borrow free of cost and do short-term swaps that they translate into long-term swaps. And with that, create fabricated, phony treasury bond demand. It, it's amazing what is happening. But, uh, you know, this is, this is going to go on forever. The, the full extent of the, the, the London whale losses are well over $100 billion. I, I think it could be on the order of a trillion dollars. And motive to murder London bankers. These London bankers are mid-level. And I'd like to just quickly make a make a story here. In, in the middle of 2011, uh, The Voice and I were having a conversation, and he said, Jim, remember for the last couple of years I've been saying that we we're very likely to have some Nuremberg banker trials to put these guys on trial for their trillion-dollar thefts and frauds and counterfeiting? And I mean, it's not going to happen, he said. It's just not going to happen. So jail time is not going to happen. Uh, he said, instead, they're just going to be put out of business or, or something else. I said, you mean like killed? And he said, yeah, but the higher-ups still won't be killed. So I came out with my forecast and said that mid-level bankers are going to be murdered. It'll take a couple of years. That was in the summer of 2011. I said it to my hat-trick letter client base. I did not say it in public articles, and I've gotten some flap from people saying, I read all your public articles. And I said, yeah, but you're not a subscriber, so you don't know what other forecasts I had. I, I thought the lower-level people wouldn't know anything. The bank tellers, the loan officers, the underwriters, the appraisers, they don't know anything. It's the middle-level guys who had the meetings uh, with, with you know carrying – maybe as much as billions of dollars in bearer bonds. The, the middle-level guys who set up the offshore Caribbean uh, shell corporations. The middle-level guys who, who met with the very shady mafia figures or, or you know, Vatican figures, the, the satanic types, the black nobility, the ones who had the direct relationship. These guys are expendable. And, and we're up to something like six or eight or ten London-based now, not, not only London-based, but J.P. Morgan employees. There have been some in Hong Kong. And now it's spilled over to Swiss reinsurance executives. They're tied in with J.P. Morgan fund managing. Wow. So we got J.P. Morgan. They've got huge holes of bankruptcy. Everything's being kept quiet. Everything's being patched, patched over. You've got QE. You've got free money. You've got no regulators doing their jobs. You've got narco money. This is a disaster in the making, and, and the U.S. is now up against the wall and has to rely on war and slaughter of civilians and threats of nuclear war and who knows, maybe even fear for virus outbreaks to defend the dollar. Yeah, there, there's just so many different news stories that are going on. I mean, it's just a, a humongous amount of pessimism, but yet, you know, you have the shale boom in Silicon Valley, which have helped prop up the U.S. economy from collapsing immediately, at least the false sense that the trade deficit has, uh, has not uh, widened or blown up yet. The trade deficit has actually contracted a bit, but um, in, in terms of, like, the U.S. Uh, treasury bond market, you know, you mentioned – the uh, stuff that J.P. Morgan has done in order to maybe uh, appear demand. Uh, what's your opinion then out of uh, the Belgium Treasury purchases? Do you think then that's the large banks like J.P. Morgan helping to facilitate that, or um, the Exchange Stabilization Fund that's uh, out of Bel uh, that's uh, you know buying the stuff out of Belgium then? Well, it's a few different things. Let's see if I can recall them all. <clears throat> to begin with, I think the Fed is using a back door uh, with the Euro Central Bank. Uh, it, it's pretty easy. You make a phone call to Draghi and say we're going to open up a, you know, a hundred billion dollars for a dollar swap facility, but uh, we'd like you to use a third of it this month for buying treasury bonds, and why don't you stuff it in Belgium because uh, they won't be able to figure that out. <laughs> okay, that, that's one. There's another one. It has to do with Basel, Basel three rules for big banks. Let's suppose you're an Irish bank or an Italian bank, and you realize, gosh, they're going to make life a lot more difficult for us 
uh, regarding bank ratios, capital ratios, fund movement, and all this. Why don't we just stuff a couple billion? This is many different banks doing the same thing. Let's just stuff a couple billion in the uh, in, in the euro clear or clear stream. I, I get the two confused. I think clear stream is Belgium and euro clear is is the, the Dutch. I'm sorry, the Deutsche Börse, uh, German. Uh, the German markets. So let's put it into the clearinghouse in Belgium, and we'll be able to retrieve that easily because it's it's out of our system here. Okay, that that's another one. Th there's a third p potential um, source for a lot of these funds. It has to do with uh, BRICS nations, emerging market nations, which hold a you know an enormous amount of forex. Uh, sovereign bonds of, of many types, and the biggest is the treasury bonds. These BRICS nations, I believe, are starting to dump treasury bonds. And this dumping is a very complex process, and I think it's coming from multiple corners, and I think it's coming from multiple different banks acting as agents for them, including BNP Paribas, that's the other side of the story. The big French bank that the U.S. government went after, I think, was helping Eastern nations to dump treasury bonds. So it's all part of the BRICS Development Bank, a.k.a. the BRICS Gold Central Bank. I think it's all part of the BRICS Development Fund doing massive, massive sourcing of gold bullion for their central bank to facilitate their gold-backed new currency, to facilitate the short-term letters of credit called the gold trade notes. So that's the third reason. <clears throat> and I think there are probably others, like uh, dirty money coming out of Russia, trying to find a safe port. Don't want to put it in a regular bank. Let's just find a, a custodian proxy. And let's use Belgium. So it could be Russian dirty money, could be Russian oligarch money, could be Russian clean money. Now, um, in, in terms, Jim, of how long you think this current system could last, I mean, we're, we're starting to hear Paul Volcker come out and say the system can't last much longer. Um, I, I had a local money manager friend here in the D.C. metro area. He went to an IMF meeting and the, uh, in the last couple of weeks, and they're talking about how much longer the system can't last. They're talking we need to do unlimited currency swaps with each other to keep this system propped up until we can move to the next system. And um, they seem to want the SDR as the next, you know, uh, global reserve reserve currency or whatever, which is a basket of unbacked debt-based fiat currencies and is even more inflationary. Uh, do you think that the, the, the um, G20 is going to allow the SDR, or do you think that they want a different system in place? Well, you mentioned before the Austrian school of money. It's sometimes called the, the school of sound money. Uh, I, I've come up with what I call, I mean, it's not my thought, it's my name. I come up with a name, I call it the, the corollary of sound money. And that states that paper money cannot be used as a reform mechanism to replace paper money. Therefore, even a, a reformed SDR, which is the IMF basket of currencies, no IMF currency, I think, will ever be adopted. And, and we've heard stories about the super sovereign reformed SDR special, what's that stand for? Special deposit? Drawing rights. Drawing rights, I think, deposit. Special drawing rights, SDR. We, we hear about the super sovereign reformed basket, where you, you've got the original four of the dollar, the euro, the yen, and the British pound. Well, they want to add in the ruble, the yuan, gold, and silver. Well, I got news for you. The U.S. is not going to go along with any super sovereign that includes Russian in anything. And furthermore, they're not going to go along with any super sovereign that, inc that includes Chinese anything. So I don't think they even want to include a super sovereign that, that has anything to do with gold and silver. Where are they going to source the gold and silver? I mean, some lunatics say, oh, gosh, this could be the IMF trying to locate gold and silver by translating some of the treasury bonds they have, and that's what the Belgian bulge is all about. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
and I'm the Pope's son. I mean, this, this is just ridiculous stuff going around as, as postulated theories. I don't think we're going to see anything regarding the IMF, which I believe is broken, defunct, and dead. I'm not even sure Christine Lagarde is a woman. I mean, <laughs> I mean we got a lot of weird things going on. I'm not sure that the White House has a married couple. I mean, man and a woman. I, I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in this world, and I don't think the IMF is going to be taken seriously for anything. Hey, look, they're broke. Why has the United States not shoved any money into the IMF for its member account for two years? Yet people are saying the IMF is going to save the global financial system? Well, the U.S. government doesn't have any faith in it. What kind of moronic talk is this? No. China is going to take control of the IMF, and they have for the last two years. Um, China might have bought a controlling stake or a very significant stake in the Federal Reserve itself. Remember that uh, last year, the 100-year contract ended, and discussion kind of fell off the cliff. What about the Federal Reserve contract? No one talks about it anymore. I think the, I think Chinese bought a big stake into it from the cabal of what I call castle dwellers, the, the satanic black nobility types. If you're wondering where the little children are, are going missing, it just look no further than the bankers. Now, we've got, we've got this unlimited currency swap. Why do they talk about unlimited? Because the derivatives require unlimited patches. I think the solution is going to come from the East. It's certainly not going to come from the West. Defense of the dollar is now very plain. It's war. It's war. Saddam Hussein had two years of, of selling oil for euros. Okay, we went to war. Iran had years and still does sales of oil and gas outside the dollar. They used Turkey to create a triangle with India and, and develop the prototype for the oil for gold trade, a brilliant workaround from the U.S. government sanctions against Iran. Why didn't the U.S. go to war with Iran? Well, they tried, but Iran has some pretty strong allies. They're called Russia and China. And Russia's on record. They said, you go to war with Iran, you're going to war with us. So what did the U.S. do? Foment a coup d'etat of fascists in Ukraine using Soros and Langley mercenaries? Control the press? My gosh, the, the Ukrainian downing of the airline. I mean, the, in Ukraine, the downing of the airline. BBC had a story with all kinds of evidence that it was the Ukraine military that did it, but that story was lifted within a few hours. We're not about truth. I mean, the first casualty of war is truth. The U.S. press is not about truth. It hasn't been for a long, long time. The solution is going to come from the East in the form of a gold, basically, predominantly gold-backed BRICS currency and gold trade note used as letter of credit. Notice that the Yuan swap facility now has something like 17 18, 20 nations, if you count the little ones like Belarus, uh, they've got almost 20 nations with the yuan swap facility for settling trade with China, which means you've got two or three giant Chinese banks, and each nation like Australia, for instance, or, or Germany, would set up five uh, designated banks to do trades in the currency, yuan and Australian dollars, yuan and euro in Germany, and those banks in China and Australia would settle the trade on a quarterly basis, on a monthly basis. I'm not sure. Well, you've got all these different nations that are already now doing non-dollar trade settlement. It's not a real big step, although it is a big step, to do the next level, which is the Iran workaround prototype. Turkey acts as the intermediary, locates the gold that India needs to pay Iran for the oil they bought. Turkish intermediary. They're going to be very big. I'm looking for Turkey and Germany both to flip east. And you're already starting to see it. Not so much with Germany because whoever controls the press comes from the political banker camp in Germany. But look at the real deals. you, you got... 3,000 German companies doing business in Russia. 
I heard that the Germans have been hired to improve contract law structures in Russia. So we, they've got a very big initiative in Russia to come up to speed. Sooner or later, and I think it's going to be when a, a contagious ripple of Western banks go under, we're just going to start seeing these Eastern nations saying, hey, look, we're going to temporarily use the Chinese yuan, but it's going to be gold back soon, and that'll be a proxy for the eventual gold back BRICS currency that's coming, and we're developing a gigantic central bank with gold bullion from it. And yeah, that's part of what the Belgian bulge was all about. I believe the U.S. government is now falsifying the tick report of foreign central bank treasury holdings. Because they don't want to show that the Belgian bulge is getting bigger and bigger. It's now, I think, bigger than the Belgian economy. Yeah, I mean, the, that wouldn't surprise me if the tick reports are falsified. I mean, GDP is falsified. Unemployment reports are falsified. The CPI is falsified. Um, I think J.P. Morgan actually just got fined by the by the uh, CFTC for, uh, for uh, pr uh, not – uh, making their commitment of traders report on gold and silver accurate. I think they've been. Uh, I, I was speaking with Dave Kranzler of uh, In Gold, uh, in, uh, Truth in Gold, and uh, he, Investment Research Dynamics. He's a hedge fund manager too, manages gold and silver, and he's been thinking that uh, J.P. Morgan's been moving some of their uh, futures contracts into into the spec position and other you know categories. They've been just moving it around and then submitting it to the public. So no, nothing surprises me anymore that the financial data is not accurate, and it's not just the U.S. government who lost it's every government who's lying, you know, stating, overstating their GDP and understating their inflation and other things. There's another lie that's really quite interesting. It's the uh, Chinese government stated official gold reserves. I think uh, in 2009 they came out and said it's, it's 1,045 tons. That brought a laughter from me uh, because I have information from The Voice who I believe has done some brokering for their acquisition of gold. He should know. But um, now there's a lot of scoop out there and you know grapevine talk that China might revise to, to show 3,000 tons. <laughs> Again, it elicits laughter because they don't want to come out and say they got 18,500 tons. They don't want to come out and say well, we got 21,600 tons. And any more than Russia is going to come out and say we got 27,000 tons. So Russia and China are well equipped for a gold-backed currency. Those are the figures, roughly, in those ballparks. Russia and China together have about 40,000 tons, at least 35,000 tons, five times what Fort Knox had four to five times what Clinton and Reuben and Bush stole from Fort Knox. So the solution is going to come from the east. And I believe Putin and Ukraine is just trying to buy time and have ballistic missiles avoided for, you know, long-range shots into Russia. He's trying to buy time and, and let Ukraine sink. And, of course, there are a lot of victims in there, a lot of Russian victims. And the U.S. press never has any correct stories about what's going on in Ukraine. I talk with people coming from the United States and visiting Costa Rica for a week or so. And I, I ask them, what have you learned about Ukraine? How did that all start? They don't have an idea. They don't have any clue at all that Langley mercenaries and Soros mercenaries were involved. But uh, the solution is going to come from the east. They're going to allow the U.S., European, British banking structures to sink. They're going to allow Ukraine to sink. Uh, I have two clients, incredibly, who have connections with Ukraine. One of them lives in the Kiev suburbs, and he's got a Gmail account. Another one has a wife who's Ukrainian who makes phone calls every week back to Kiev. So I'm actually given some information, and in addition to that, I've got this new guy named Yaroslav who lives in St. Petersburg, and he's got a lot of connections. He's bilingual, and he, he passes on information about various things. And then I've got this Hungarian client who's got some Russian friends and, and Ukraine contacts. And what I've learned is that 
they've got at most 80% of the fields planted in Ukraine, which has tremendous farmland quality like Iowa. But with under 80% planted, they're going to have some extreme food shortages because the harvest is going to be insufficient. And who knows, maybe many of the trucks will be hijacked. Or who knows, maybe there won't be enough trucks because the government's commandeered the trucks. So the whole infrastructure system is disrupted. I don't I, I have been on record saying they didn't do any planting. I, I'm trying to correct that here. It's at most 80% planted for the seeds in the field. So I believe a tremendous disruption is coming. And you know, there's a new byline semi-joke that as soon as Southstream comes online next year, the, the stock in the Ukraine transit lines for gas will be cut 50% in value. Well, you've already got Nord Stream operating that, that supplies Russian gas to German industry. They got LNG ports in uh, the, the northern parts, the northern, uh, what do you call it? The northern sea coast locations of Germany. I mean, a little known fact Americans just don't think this way. They think in terms of the crappy, fallacious propaganda spewed out, but 40% of all the gas that's used not gasoline, natural gas, used in, in Germany is from Russia. 30% of all the crude oil that's used in Germany is from Russia. They're not going to do sanctions because they don't want to cut their own economic throat. France is already making a lot of waves over uh, the Mistral warship contract. Now they're making new waves over the $9 billion fine against, um, it's the National Bank of Paris, BNP, Paribas. Um, the, the French central bank governor is on record a month ago as saying, this is insane. There's no reason why two nations need to settle with the dollar, nor hold reserves in the dollar. Okay. The, the insurrection is coming from the East and the West. We got game over here, Jason. This is game over for the dollar. And, you know, we haven't talked about Saudi Arabia at all, but let it be known that the petrodollar. Save it for next time. Pardon me? We can save Saudi Arabia and the petrodollar for the next interview. We're over an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but just let it be known that the petrodollar is dead. The divorce between the U.S. and the Saudis is over. And the love fest, uh, you know, like every month there's a new conference between ministers of Saudi Arabia and ministers of, of China. They got a Petro Yuan coming. It's coming online. Yeah, with the large refinery that they're co-building, right, and the pipelines that are not really going there. I mean, the U.S. seems to uh, the people in the U.S. seem to be infatuated with the shale oil boom, and they think it's a panacea, and they're saying that you know we don't need the Saudis and stuff anymore. That seems to be a lot of the um, the uh, beliefs now out of the politicians in uh, D.C. Well, they got some rude awakenings like the Monterey shale write down of their reserves 96 percent write down that's i'd call that significant if it were 12 percent i call it significant but 96 is extremely significant we got you know the fracking has incredibly rapid decline rates so in a year or two there was another one i think it's called monticello uh that was operating in my old stomping grounds western pennsylvania i've lost my pittsburgh accent it took some time but i got rid of it um, it was kind of a West Virginia hillbilly kind of accent. It was very weird, but I got rid of it in college. Being around Ohio kids enough, I got rid of it. But something called, I think it's called the Monticello firm. No, no, Medallion. Medallion, I'm sorry. Medallion, they operated in western Pennsylvania in 2012 and 13. They pulled out. They're done. So what's the longevity of this fracking concept? There's none. Now, you've got to do new wells and new wells and more new wells to compensate for the very rapid decline rate. The decline rate is something like 50, 60, 70 percent after two years. 
Yeah, a, a lot of the producers also, Jim, are not generating any free cash flow from the oil. They've been a benefactor of the cheap debt that Wall Street has financed. So they've taken advantage of that low interest rate debt to go buy oil and drill and things like that that they wouldn't have in a normal interest rate environment been able to do that. And their debt, um, uh, um, in terms of their financials, they're not generating free cash flow, like I said, but their debt is actually growing a humongous amount uh, faster than their uh, re revenues and earnings. Oh, okay. so it's Not only that on the business side, Jason, but on the financial side, the trading side, Platt's Energy Office used to be a Morgan Stanley fixture. And it, it was sold to Rosneft, the big Russian oil firm. I mean, we, this is game over. Okay, well, I, I think we should leave it at that. It, you've, you've definitely given our listeners a lot of interesting things to think about. Uh, most important thing is the derivatives market is hanging over every other single market, and that's why I guess people need physical gold and silver as an insurance policy then. Uh, if and – well, not if, but when the system uh, – we do move to the next system, whatever the next system is. The next system is going to be – Gold back predominantly, but maybe gold, silver, oil, and possibly gas. But gas is more complicated to put into a, a four-part asset-backed global currency for the BRICS because every continent has a different price for natural gas. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, and there's a lot of transportation. Natural gas is a local market right now, though. Maybe with the US LNG, they'll have a national market, but that's years to come. Well, um, I just want to thank you again for your time, Jim. Uh, please tell our listeners more about the Hattrick letter and uh, the Golden Jackass. Okay. Ten years ago, April, I started the Hattrick letter and, and really went full-blown with the, the website, the Golden Jackass. Before that time, I, I had posted – uh, some of my public articles going back a, a year or, or a little more, but I posted other people's articles. Starting in April of 2004, the Hattrick letter uh, came to be, and it's been a pretty wild success. It's a labor of love. It's a lot of work. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of a slave to my computer and, and um, the business here, but I enjoy it. I, I, I do the same thing all over again. On the website, you'll find a lot of free material on the, the main public page. It includes public articles by me, and it also includes radio interviews like this, which I'll post as soon as it's available. But there's also the main, the main thrust of the website, which is the newsletter. There are two monthly publications, which means that every month I publish two reports. One's called the Global Money War Report. It's about high-level issues about the battle for the, the dollar, preserving the dollar, war over the dollar, uh, competitive currency events, lots of central bank policies. And then there's a second report I call the golden currency report, which is more ground level, like coin demand and policies in India that, that inhibit uh, imports and, oh, lots and lots of other things, new openings of uh, uh, competitors like the Shanghai Gold Exchange to compete with uh, the comics in London and how there's a premium for the Indian price of gold and a premium for the Shanghai price of gold. We've got some real big competitive competitions going on. So go to the website, look around, see what you can find for free that, that interests you, but then sign up for the newsletter, which I guarantee contains a lot more than the, the public articles. The public articles are basically about a certain theme. Uh, like like the derivatives here. There was an article a week ago about derivatives. Um, but the, the reports, they're really bottom up. What's happening? Let's put together a hundred different stories. All right, let's organize it into chapters. And, and that's how the two reports come to be. It, it's very dependent on events, what's happening, and therefore it's highly relevant. You, you can never look at one of my monthly reports for the paid subscription service and say, yeah, but that's not really tied to what's going on. They're all tied. Every chapter's tied to what's going on. And, and they're full of forecasts. And I explain my analytic reasoning and explain the, the, the new forecast and talk about some of the correct forecasts. And we got a, a bunch of them pending, but my, my big, big forecast pending is that the U.S. government will default on its debt. And I made it back in uh, post Lehman 2008. And, of course, I got a lot of comments saying, oh, what an idiotic thing to say. The U.S. got a printing press. Yeah, and I think the printing press, through the interest rate derivatives that we discussed, are going to break. 
they're all going to break, and I think the London whale is evidence of it breaking. The Belgian bulge is evidence of it breaking. The London murders of J.P. Morgan folks is evidence of it breaking. The war in Ukraine and Syria, they all have a common denominator, Russian gas. These, the evidence is pointing to war being a consequence of the system breaking. Everything is breaking. We even had a, an extension for the, the debt limit. There is no debt limit now for the U.S. government. So we've already got the defaults. And you have foreign nations, one after the other, not buying treasury bonds. And I think the tick report's being falsified. And the whole system is held together by interest rate derivatives and quantitative easing with bond monetization that's not sterilized. The system is breaking. It's already broken. And war and fraud and broken markets, controlled markets, is your evidence. So better be prepared. Get out of your stock markets and the dollar. Get out of your savings accounts and CDs and the banks that are in the dollar. Get yourself in gold and silver and get yourself a foreign vault. Yeah, I, I think definitely people who have a lot of physical metal, they should definitely, if they can afford to do so, diversify into multiple countries. Because uh, uh, the number one will, rule I tell my listeners before before we uh, end the interview, Jim, is that the politicians can change the rules anytime they want. I think that's rule number one. Yeah, and I think they're going to start making a national project about buying for ridiculously low prices the mining companies to secure their properties. <clears throat> It won't, okay. it won't be hard. They're already, you know, selling for pennies. I had my subscribers in in early, what was it, spring of 2009. I said, get out. No, 2008, before Lehman. I said, get out of the mining companies. They're going down to pennies. Get out of them. All right, well, it's been a pleasure being on, Jason, and uh, we covered a lot of ground, but I think it's very important ground and, and the derivatives of the common theme, and it is – their usage and abuse is evidence of the broken system. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's it's really sad, you know, when there's so many industry people who supposedly know the financial system and they don't know anything about this. But I guess it's been done intentionally where, you know, it's been compartmentalized. So only a certain number of people, like, in the whole system understand what's really going on. I think very few people inside the system understand what's going on. And I point a finger in my, my private reports of – of a few individuals who used to know what's going on, and now they're singing the song from the other side. So they've been bought out from their financial firms by the syndicate, and now they're preaching the lies.